Hello my friends and welcome, my name is Dennis and this is the latest update from Ukraine. We see the usual picture almost every day. Russia is losing their aviation this night, they lost one Suhoi 34. And just little later morning time they lost two more Suhoi 34 fighter bombers. So for 11 consecutive days Russia lost 13 of the aircraft. It is just outstanding. If this trend continues for the next two weeks, they're gonna lose the same number of the airplanes that they are able to produce per year. So we may come to conclusion that they use the midwave tactics not just on the ground, but also in the skies. So why mostly Suhoi 34? Because those are used as a bombers. The Russian army prioritized hitting a ground target instead of the safety of the airplanes. The range of the Russian-made gliding bombs which they drop from those airplanes is shorter compared to, for example, JDAMs. So to drop those, the Russian airplanes go into the danger zone. Now Russian Air Force start to use more of the Suhoi 25 attack airplanes, those were spotted on the way to Avdivka. It is even safer to operate attack airplanes close to the front lines instead of Suhoi 34 nowadays, however, attack airplanes are unable to drop the gliding bombs from the very high altitude, they mostly launch the uncontrolled missiles, which are in lack of precision, so effectiveness. The speaker of the Ukrainian Air Force Ignat confirmed that Ukraine has the long-range weaponry to hit the Russian airplanes. He didn't mention the name, but we know that it is the Patriot system. Ukraine uses it on the south as well as on the east. Meanwhile, today some of the Russian officials went to Suhoi factory, where Suhoi 34s are being produced. Maybe they want to calm down the Russian society, saying that they have many more of those aircraft. But we know the real figures. Suhoi factory is able to produce around 17 of the airplanes of this class, including Suhoi 34 and Suhoi 35. Plus, they also produce the fifth generation of the airplane, Suhoi 57, but not a lot. So totally around 20 airplanes per year. You see, they are not even showing the full capability of the factory on those photos. And I wouldn't say that this hunger is really big. What they show basically are the three airplanes in the facility and the most part of the hangar floor is occupied by the personnel, people who listen to some of the Russian officials. Russia also wants to restart the production of the A-50 AVAX airplanes, but they lost the proper technology after the Soviet Union collapse. That's why I don't think that it is possible. Russia still has some of those unique aircraft, for example, this one was spotted in Tangenrog, around 200 kilometers away from the front lines. You know what is interesting about all of this stuff? Russian pilots were bombing Ukrainian cities. They thought that they are safe out there, but now imagine the fear that they experience in their every flight, when they see that their friends are not coming from their flights daily. Especially Suhoi 34 pilots. They understand that with this scale of the losses, the chances for them to caput are very high, almost like in the Second World War. And there is no tool to secure them in those mid-wave attacks. Alright guys, now let's go to the front lines update, we have some interesting news out there. For a very long time, good news for Ukraine. Let's go to Avdivka direction, well today Russian forces were pushed out a little from Orlivka. Ukraine is now on a counter-attack in this place. We have the information about it from our General Commander Siski. He said that Ukraine sent some of the reinforcements to the place and worked on the previously done mistakes. I guess that the main idea is not to let Russians cross this river westbound. In that case, they might advance towards those fields and there is no any settlement to stop them. To organize the proper defense, so potentially Russia might occupy all of this territory. But now Ukraine is more proactive. Also, one more counterattack is started towards the power from Berdichi. We even have the change in this map. So it was yesterday and it is today. Few meters gained, but nevertheless, Ukraine tries to get the initiative in this part of the front lines. The Michael Santos resource confirmed that the Ukraine was successful in pushing Russians away from Krasnohorivka. I told you about this case yesterday, Ukraine has some of the losses in the armor vehicles. But what is even more interesting that Ukraine was able to push Russians away from Robotine. We have the confirmation about it also from the Michael 73. He analyzes the drone images and says that Russians were not successful in the place. Basically, it was the trap created for the Russian forces. They entered the village, they were ambushed by Ukrainian army and were forced to retreat. 
it happened already many times per few days. And also we have the clarification from the Bakhmut direction near to Klishivka. You see the green area expanded just a little, so it was yesterday and it is today. Today Russia also lost the air defense system TOR. It is quite sophisticated system, which was targeted by Ukrainian FPV drone. It happened on the south. And this happened near to Sochi, Russian Federation, the Russian air defense sponsor S tired and decided to have a rest. It's not the first case, by the way, there were at least two of those recorded. This thing has a very high center of gravity. The Kamas lorry is unable really to carry all of that stuff, but Russian designers do not care. Or didn't, then they design the stuff. One more evidence that Russia is using the Starlings all around the front lines. So this is the Russian volunteer with some of the Russian soldiers. They show what they bought for the Russian army, some of the Mavics, it's the usual stuff, but here we see Starlink terminals. They say, okay, it's the new product for us, but anyways, we have the supplement and we're gonna send it to the front lines. I'm personally aware that Starlink knows the exact position of their antennas. And still Starlink allows those antennas to operate for the Russian side. A fresh ambushment of the Russian forces near to Avdivka. As you see, Russia continue to use BTRs. For Russia it's good because they are in lack of BMPs, but still they have tremendous losses. We have the fresh photos of the Russian convoy which was ambushed near to Vuledar. Russia lost many of the vehicles out there. Dozens of tanks, MTLBs and other armored vehicles. Some of the tanks were just disassembled into the tiny parts. The usual picture for the Russian army. Saying honestly, Ukraine also has losses, but in most of the cases, crew of our tanks survive. The Western vehicles are made to protect the crew, unlike the Soviet made. Soviets didn't care about the crew members, their main goal was the effectiveness and the massive production. The problem for Ukraine that we are in lack of the evacuation equipment and also it is hard to evacuate the vehicles at the front lines. That is why some of the Leopards were lost in Avdivka, so Ukraine just finished them over there with the help of the FPV drones or sometimes with the help of the tanks, just not to let them go to the Russian side. The weight of the tank is around 70 tons, so it's very hard to pull it out in those kind of the cases. The confirmed vehicle losses for the last three days, Russia lost 163 of the vehicles, Ukraine 66. It's 1 to 3, almost 1 to 2.8, let's say. And here we have the confirmation that Ukraine lost Nassim's launcher, unfortunately. It happened because of the missile strike, so it wasn't a drone attack. The Abrams tank that Ukraine lost wasn't destroyed really, it was hit by the FPV drone at the back of the turret where the ammunition compartment is located. The crew evacuated successfully, they're all alive, good news. But the tank was left near to Stepova. Ukraine has no chance to evacuate it right now. The Russian iceberg ship got fired today in St. Petersburg. It's hard to say what happened out there, there are few of the versions, but for sure it wasn't the drone attack. Russia has many of the icebreaker ships and continue to build those. I think that their main goal is to influence the Arctic Ocean with those icebreakers. Because no other country has that fleet of those kind of the ships. Today Putin held a very long speech towards, towards the Russian elite, let's say. Politicians, religions, businessmen, it's the usual stuff that yearly happens in Russia. I listened just a part of it because I couldn't handle 2 hours and 6 minutes. He was talking about his usual stuff, his own biased opinion on Russia, on the world. He says that the majority of the Russian people do support the special military operation. But actually, even according to pro-Kremlin polls, around 70% of Russians would like to stop the special military operation. Normal people call it a war. He also says that the Russian business supports the special military operation, which means that sanctions were applied properly and should be applied even more on every sphere of the Russian business. Putin admitted that there are some of the problems inside the Russian army, but they're working on it. And in general, the Russian army is the best of the best. Also, the Russian commanders are doing everything to reduce the losses of the Russian soldiers. The face of the Russian military commander from the crowd, then he heard it. By the way, there is some Ukrainian flag on the back, some of the spy. Putin admitted that Russia is using a new hypersonic weaponry against the Ukrainians. He said about the hypersonic Zircon missile, yes indeed it is the new one that was used against the civilian infrastructure in Kyiv. And he is very happy and proud about it. 
Also, Putin continued to blame the Western countries, and we see that he really afraid about the recent Macron speech. Then the French president said that they might send some of the forces to Ukraine. President Macron stated it a couple of days ago, so Putin had to correct his speech today. He said that Russia will respond with missiles against the countries who would deploy their forces, as he says, in our country. So for Putin, Ukraine is our country. Again, he gave no difference between Ukraine and Russia. In his mindset, it's all one big thing. Like Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, but even in Soviet Union, Ukraine was a separate state. Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Putin is definitely sick. Even biased Tucker Carlson, who took the interview from Vladimir Putin, says that something is wrong with the Russian president, then he spoke about denazification. Let's listen to his statement. Speaking of Putin saying that justification for continuing the war is denazification. I thought it was one of the dumbest things I'd ever heard. I didn't understand what it meant. The dumbest thing I have ever heard. It means that Putin is dumb because he speaks dumbest things. Denazification? It literally means what it sounds like. You know, I, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I don't, I hate that whole conversation because it, it's not real. It's just ad hominem. It's a way of associating someone with an evil regime that doesn't exist anymore. A few days ago, Mr. Carlson said that there is the problem with Nazis in Ukraine. We understand that there is the problem with Nazis all around the world in each country. In United States, in Russia, and believe me, there are more Nazis in Russia than in Ukraine because the population is bigger. Also, the Russian peace ideology is the fascism itself. About the possible deployment of the NATO forces in Ukraine, the French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal says that there is the project to protect Ukrainians' borders with French forces. Also, improve the air defense and train Ukrainian army. So we see clear statements from French officials on many levels, President, Prime Minister, that they will not let Russia win. They say that France is under the direct threat by the Russian army. And since France is the only country in the European Union which has nukes, it understands the responsibility for the region's security. If Russia, for example, attacks Baltic countries, it will be up to France to protect them at first, probably even using nukes. That's why France wants to stop Russia in Ukraine. The French President Macron said that all of his words about the troops in Ukraine were well weighted before. And France will do everything not to let Russia win. Putin today really was shocked about it. Do you remember this meeting right before the war Then the French president visited Moscow and spoke with Putin at this very long table? I think that it was a warning from Macron. Putin, you're going to do a very terrible stuff and you will lose. But Putin was so sure that he is able to occupy Ukraine in just a few days and so determined to start the war that he didn't listen to anyone. The Ukrainian resistance was a real surprise for the Russian president. He was panicking after a few days then the war had started. The full-scale war, because the actual war with Russia lost since 2014, so 10 years already. So France is really determined right now to provide security for all of the region of the European Union and they try to gather as many countries as possible for this mission. Yes, indeed, there is the chance that France might potentially use their forces in Ukraine or elsewhere if it is needed. The Estonian Prime Minister Kai Kallas also said that Western leaders should look through the possibility of sending ground troops to Ukraine. Kallas stressed that leaders must discuss all options behind closed doors, including of what more could be done to help Ukraine. Meanwhile, some of the other leaders of the European countries said that their forces will not be involved in this war. Unfortunately, we have backfire from Chancellor Scholz. He officially stated that British soldiers are being deployed in Ukraine already. They are helping the Ukrainian army to operate with Storm Shadow cruise missiles. He stated it yesterday and uncovered a classified information. Olaf, please keep calm and support Ukraine. Do not spread this information elsewhere. Oh my god. Well, I guess that there are some of the British technicians in Ukraine helping to maintain those missiles. At the same time, German Chancellor decided not to send the Taurus cruise missiles, as I said to you already three days ago. Today he stressed it again that Ukraine might use those missiles even to attack Moscow. So what's the bad thing about it? 
<laughs> Meanwhile, Finland officials say that they are quite okay if Ukraine would use their weaponry to target military infrastructure on the territory of the Russian Federation. But Finland doesn't have the Taurus cruise missiles and they are not able to send those to Ukraine, sadly. The Pentagon chief Lloyd Austin says that if Ukraine loses this war, the NATO countries would have to fight against Russian forces. He is very concerned about the Russian advantage on the east and also that American help is not provided to Ukraine. At the same time, Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, was asked about the military support of Ukraine. Let's listen what he said, if you will understand something. 23 uh, leaders of parliament of uh, Europe, uh, they're calling on you to pass aid to Ukraine. Do you have any answer to them? The, the House is looking at all available options right now, and we'll, we'll, get, um, we'll address that as soon as the government is fine. As far as I understood, we're going to address it as far as the government fund will be voted or something like that. So he's not saying about the border issue any longer. Couple of words about so-called Polish protesters. They are going to block the border also with Lithuania. What is happening now in Poland is the total outrage and outlaw act by those so-called protesters. And again, Polish government doesn't do anything. You see, then Poland was accepted to the European Union. Germans didn't block anything for Poland, but then Ukraine got the right from the European Union to sell or transit the grains through the European countries. Here comes the protesters. They will block the border with Lithuania because they think that all of the grains that were transited to Lithuania will go back to Poland. You may write me any kind of the comments regarding those protesters. It doesn't really matter because we should follow legislation. If Ukraine is officially allowed to sell the grains in the European Union or transit the grains through the European Union countries, it should be allowed. If Poland thinks that it shouldn't be done like that, they should apply for the European Union to solve this issue by voting again in democratic way. But what they are doing, I mean protesters, is total outlaw and outrage. And not all of the Polish farmers are out there, actually not many if you check out the number of the Polish farmers. So since the beginning of the war, Ukraine has the same rights as the European Union countries to sell or transit the agriculture products in the European Union. It was done to support the Ukrainian economy. And now, because of that, we have the harm for Ukrainian economy. So from one side, the Polish government supports Ukraine. Then they are speaking about the Russian invasion. But in fact, they do not do anything to unblock the roads for Ukrainian grains. It is not a good friendship or allied attitude. There is the website showing the percentage of the GDP divided in sectors for Poland, for example. 2.38% of agricultural sector of the Polish economy. We understand that this sector might be harmed a little than Ukrainian grain went into the European Union. But again, this is what happened with Germans, for example, then Poland was accepted into the European Union and start to sell their cheap grain in Germany. There were no any blockades or something from the German side. And Poland wasn't in the state of war with Russia. The Ukrainian economy was ambushed by Russians. That is why the European Union took this legislation to support Ukraine. And Poland is the part of the European Union, so it should obey the rules. But no, it's better to devastate the Ukrainian economy even more. We have the meaning in Ukrainian, uh, they're shooting their own legs because Ukraine is now defending Poland too. And there is the chance for Russia to come to Poland after all. The so-called Russian peace, which many of the Polish farmers are waiting for, based on their mindset. We see the anti-Ukrainian propaganda from those Polish farmers' side. They didn't go through the experience of Ukrainian refugees, for example, who lost their homes and loved ones. And there is the chance for the Polish farmers to flee Poland for Germany as a refugees if Russian peace would go to their country. They will be sitting in the refugee camp thinking, oh right, I was blocking the grains for Ukraine. Meanwhile, Poland is not blocking the Russian grains. Our journalists went to Poland for investigation. They say that hundreds of lorries carrying the Russian agriculture products go through Belarus to Poland. During the investigation, the Ukrainian journalist team was arrested by the Polish internal security forces. They confiscated the cameras of our journalists and returned them back with formatted SD cards. Nevertheless, our journalists were able to recover some of the data from those cards and will publish the full investigation video about the trade between Russia and Poland very soon. So why Polish farmers are not blocking the Russian grain 
which goes into Poland. The Polish Prime Minister Tusk understood that the trade with Russia was uncovered. It was never hidden, actually. But blocking Ukrainian grain and not blocking Russians is very strange. That's why he now says that it's time to block the agricultural products from Russia. He wouldn't say so if there was no attention to this topic from the journalist side. Not just from Ukrainian journalists, but from others too. You know, I don't really like the Hungarian government, the rhetoric towards Ukraine, but what Hungary now does, it opens the capabilities for Ukrainian agricultural products export. They simplify the customs rules at the border with Ukraine. It is now the alternate way for Ukrainian export. And the rhetorics of the Hungarian leaders is different, right, compared to the Polish leaders, but at the same time they continue to support the Ukrainian economy, so Ukrainian army. Because army is being financed from the Ukrainian economy. And what Poland is doing, uh, I think it's, it's very stupid. It's even worse compared to the military aid blockade in the United States. After all, I understand they're really far away across the ocean. The conflict between the United States and Russia is nearly impossible if we speak about the distance. But Poland is here and it's not willing to support the Ukrainian economy, so Ukrainian army. My friends, it's my opinion, I have the right for it. By the way, there was the attempt from the Hungarian farmers to block the border with the Ukraine, but Hungary solved it out. The president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, also said about the possible negotiations that could potentially take place in Istanbul. Could the sides return to what it was two years ago? I believe it's not possible. The Turkish leader also says that he supports the peace plan of Vladimir Zelensky, which says that all of the Ukrainian territories should be given back to Ukraine, by the way. Also a couple of days ago, President Zelensky visited Saudi Arabia, the country that also wants to be a mediator in negotiations. Kind of interesting, we'll see how it goes. My friends, please don't forget to press your huge like to this video, by doing so you help me a lot. And also, if you want to support my job, you may find some of the links in the video description just below. You may support me on Patreon or on the sponsorship of this YouTube channel, obviously if you want. Thank you so much for your kind support. My friends, I wish you all a peaceful sky wherever you are and have a great time.